all of you are going to be impacted by another technology that I think is even bigger than anything I've talked about already. And that technology is how we process information. I think this is at the heart of what's changing in the world. If I were only asked to speak for 15 minutes and were only allowed to speak on one thing, I think this is the single point that should be made about what's changing in our world right now. Where we find information, who we trust to give us information, how we process that information, where we store that information, that's all changing. And that's going to change the way we interact with other people. It's going to change how we buy things. Therefore, it must change how we sell things. It will therefore change how we manage people, uh, how we communicate with them. It will change the very need for management itself. It will change organizational structures. It will change everything. There are two main reasons why information technology is changing the world so much at the moment. The first is that we just have had over the last few years a massive increase in computing power. Now this isn't anything new. Computing power has been doubling every 18 months for the last 40 years. <coughs> but in the last 18 to 24 months that doubling has suddenly made a huge difference. Like putting more computing power in a tablet computer than existed in the entire world when Neil Armstrong stood on the moon. And, and that's not even your primary computer. And that goes for the phone in your pocket as well. Extraordinary power. The most remarkable amount of storage space. And of course bandwidth speed is dramatically increasing in many parts of the world. Add that all together and we've reached a moment in history where computers can do what we imagined they could do. The second reason that information technology is really changing the world is because of these young people. Not those four specific young people, but these young people who were born in 1989. Now 1989, as many of you know, was a very important year. I say many of you because in almost half of the world's countries, 1989 saw a very important turning point in history. Uh, for instance, it was Tiananmen Square, uh, was in 1989. Uh, the Berlin Wall came down in 1989. Uh, Ceausescu in Romania was deposed in 1989. Uh, some countries slightly delayed. So in South Africa, Nelson Mandela was released in February of 1990. In Chile, uh, Augusta Pinochet stepped down in March of 1990. But there was this moment in time from about mid-1989 to early 1990 when everything changed. 1989 was also the year that the internet as we know it today was born. Not the technology but web pages. HTML, which is the language of the internet, was developed by Sir Tim Berners-Lee at CERN in 1989. A very remarkable year. And these young people who were born in 1989 started work at your company last year. And they are, as you can see from the label, digital natives. Most of us in this room are, are, are digital immigrants. Uh, we, we speak digital, but it's kind of a fourth or fifth language. For some of you, maybe a twelfth uh, language. I don't think there are any digital dinosaurs around in the room, but maybe you are. But we're not digital natives. But if you have children or you know young people, you'll know what I'm talking about with this digital native concept. Those four young people are actually sending text messages to each other. Yeah? They might even be in relationships with each other. They're not sending text messages because they're lazy or stupid or they have no social skills. That is their choice, their first choice for communication with each other. That's how they choose to engage with each other and the world. And they're coming soon to an office near you. And I don't think we're ready for them. We're not ready for them as leaders. We're not ready for them as organizations. And we're certainly not ready for them as customers. I, I had an experience of this just uh, personally recently. The, the fact that these young people live in a world which is always on. Anything they want to know, they can know and they do know. There are, to put it another way, there are no mysteries 
for these young people. Think about that. No mysteries in the world. I was walking through a supermarket with my uh, three daughters. I have three of them, uh, 12, 10, and 6. My wife said we should give them names, but I thought numbers were fine. Um, anyway, 12, 10, and 6 were with me, and we were walking through a, a, a mall, a supermarket, and there was some music playing. And like any 40-year-old, uh, I kind of caught a little bit of it and thought, that's a nice piece of music, never heard that before. And like any 40-year-old, I asked the question, I wonder what that is. That was a kind of a nice piece of music, and I thought, oh, I wonder who it was. I wonder what that is, is a question I'm fairly used to asking. You're driving past a building, oh, I wonder what that is. A car drives past, you've never seen that style of car, I wonder what that is. And you don't expect an answer. I mean, who can know everything? It's just a question. But of course, my daughters don't live in that world. My 12-year-old, Amy, uh, said, Dad, give me your phone. On the phone, she had loaded a, a program called SoundHound. Now, uh, oh, whoops, where is my SoundHound gone? Now, some of you uh, know this, some of you use Shazam. Uh, there are other options available. But what SoundHound does, if, for those of you who don't know, is you basically just hold your phone up and you record 20 seconds of the song you're listening to. Shazam even allows you to sing the song. Uh, yourself if you just have it in your head. It then, and now listen to this please very carefully, it takes that 20 second sound bite and uploads it to the International Music Database which keeps a copy, and, and listen to this, it keeps a copy of every single version of every single song ever recorded. And it finds out what song you're listening to. And in less than 10 seconds, it sends back this information. I've put it in a Samsung screen just to show you that other options are available. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an iPhone fan. Uh, this wasn't the song that we were listening to. This is just a, a well-known song, so Angels by Robbie Williams. Uh, it then tells you what album it's on. Um, it's uh, obviously designed uh, in Japan because the lyrics are there in case you want to do karaoke in the supermarket. Uh, very important. Um, you've got links to YouTube videos. Uh, you've got, obviously, a link to buy it. This is a free app, but in order to make their money, they get commission on the fact that you go in and buy the song. They then also recommend you know, a number, I had 27 recommendations. If you like the song, you might also like. And I bought about 12 of them. By the time that song had finished playing, not only did I know what song it was, I owned it. That's the world the digital natives live in. I wonder how much management information flows at that speed through your organization. Anything I need to, I've just made a sale. I wonder how that impacts my targets and the company's targets. Doesn't work like that, does it? You walk over then with my daughters to any product in any store and they do the same process with barcodes. They don't need salespeople to help them because all they do is they take a photograph of the barcode and do the same thing with a different app called Barcode Reader which downloads all the information that is known about that product, more than any salesperson could ever reasonably ex be expected to know. My daughters freak salespeople out because they know more than the salesperson does. This is what I think social media is about. I don't think that social media has developed because the technology is there. I think the technology has developed because this younger generation has demanded this digital connection with the planet. Of course, social media can waste your time. You can use social media to find out what Lady Gaga had for breakfast. Because anything that is possible to be known can be known. But that doesn't make the technology a problem. It just makes people who misuse the technology a problem. And I don't think, again, as businesses, we've begun to understand this. So we block access to social media because we don't think that we can trust people to use it wisely, rather than simply helping people to use it wisely. Social media is about the way that today's young people in particular, but many of us, most of us probably, 
choose to connect, to contribute, to engage, to be involved in conversations. It can be used to waste your time, it can be used for some remarkable uh, things in terms of connecting, engaging and selling. So, we can get any information anywhere at any time and we can engage and connect with other people all the time. We can also look at that information in dramatically different ways. Augmented reality is again going to be one of those trends in the next three to four years that comes to dominate our lives. Augmented reality is our ability to see the data that exists in the world. Uh, and very simply what we mean by that is the sat-nav or the GPS device in your car. So there's nothing new to us, you, you know this. There's the road out there, the real world, and inside your car there's a screen that's giving you information about that real world. The name of the road, where to turn right and left. Just put that in your phone now. Put that in a handheld device. This is my favorite augmented reality app. It's that little red line, it's called Nearest Tube. I know there's one for Paris and for Tokyo and New York, this is for London. And basically what you do is you hold your phone up and because your phone not only knows where you are, but also which direction you're facing, if you tell it where you want to go, a little red line appears on your phone and you just follow it. It takes you to the nearest tube station, tells you which train to catch when you get off the other side, it again shows you where to walk. As you're walking along, it also picks up all sorts of information that is available to the app from the world around it, like specials in stores that you're walking past, or restaurants that you might like to eat at. Please tell me why you'd advertise in a newspaper when you can do that. Uh, you know, I have no idea. Now, the only downside of this app is that if we're all walking around London like this, uh, we're going to probably bump into each other a little bit too often. So you probably want to put that inside your glasses rather than on your phone in a kind of heads up display or as two or three companies are already working on in a contact lens that beams the data directly onto your retina um, so that other people can't see it which would be magnificent for a course like this imagine I walked into this course and as I looked at the audience it basically picked up your face did facial recognition and I didn't just know your name and company and the country you come from but I'd know everything that is known about you now, yeah, <laughs> maybe a bad example, Dennis, I don't know. Um, we don't have to be scared about this again, uh, uh, Khalid, because it's only the information that you have made available. It's not your police records or the hidden data, can't access your bank account, uh, but it's what you've made available, your LinkedIn profile, your Facebook profile, your last Twitter updates. Or, if you're a salesperson in a shop, and my daughter walks in the door, wouldn't it be wonderful if you had the last five years of purchasing history pop up in your glasses? Not only did you know, here's Amy, age 12, but you know that Amy, age 12, on the third week of January, whenever she walks into our store, buys a present for her mother. Must be mother's birthday. Who's Amy's mother? Boom, yes, birthday, 26th of January. So, Amy's probably here to buy a present. I know the fast, last five years presents that she's bought her mother. Amy, let me help you. Now we're talking. Now you've got power back as a salesperson because you know the data and the history of these people that are coming in. We could spend time, we don't have the time this evening, to talk about the fact that it's not only people engaging with information, it's machine to machine or the internet of things. IBM uses the phrase uh, on their website, A Smarter Planet, that if every object in the world is instrumented and interconnected then intelligence begins to flow but I'll leave you to look that up for yourself what I'm really saying is this all your data is going to be always available everywhere on any device all the time and you will have access to everything that anybody has ever known anywhere and if that can't change the world then nothing can so what are the implications for you as a leader, as a manager in your business? Again, we're going to take the rest of the week answering this question. Let me give you just five or six minutes of potential implications and then give you a chance to have a quick chat about it.